Hello. Welcome BBU families. We'll give people a minute or two here to join us. We see the attendees popping up pretty quick here, so that is a great sign. Uh, and just so you know, we are currently recording, so this can be shared afterwards for anybody who misses it or anybody who needs to leave early. Thank you all for registering. We appreciate you being here. We know this is probably your 1,000th Zoom call of the past two months. All right, so we'll let attendees join for a bit longer and then we'll get rolling. Um, just for some quick introductions, um, I know many of you. My name is Jen Larrick. I'm the Director of Coaching. I'll pass it this way. Sure. Hi, I'm Chris Boys. I'm the President of BVU. And I'm Greg Holker, the Technical Director. Awesome. So as we get started here, um, I just want you to know that you can send in questions to us via the Q&A function uh, and also via the chat. Um, the chat will just go to us. Uh, and we'll work in questions as we go if we're able, and then we'll take, uh, go through some questions at the end, the last maybe 10, 15 minutes. We hope that our uh, information and our presentations answer the majority of your questions, um, but if not, feel free to chime in at the end there. So with that, I will pass it to uh, Chris Boys um, with a welcome and an outline of the night. Sure, well, <clears throat> I wanna thank all of the families for taking their time out of the night and giving us a little bit of an opportunity just to, to speak to you all about what we're doing as a club and, and how we got to this point in this you know, sort of crazy summer, honestly. And, and, and in particular, I wanted to, to thank you for all of your uh, patience as we've you know, had to change lanes and, and make, make changes on the fly as we've gotten different information and, and tried to hang on and, and got to the point where we, we eventually had to to cancel the season, so uh, which is not what any of us wanted, and, and we'll talk tonight about how we can make the the best of, of that. So, just by way of an agenda tonight, we'll talk. We'll kind of talk about a little bit about how we got to this return to play um, spot, and and we'll talk about the things that BVU has done as a club, including the the COVID nineteen web page that we've created that has resources and things like that. Um, I want to talk about the refunds and, and the process and some of the options moving forward for that. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the surveys that we sent out. Um, it was an incredible response rate. So once again, our BVU families were just hit it out of the, the ballpark in terms of responding to our survey, which was helpful to, to, to allow us to plan and, and move things forward as well. So again, I really appreciate the, that 83% participation, which is just insane for a for a survey, so um, again, thank you for that. Um, we'll talk about the return to play documents for the coaches and, and how we're going to establish our, our, our safety. Obviously, safety is the number one concern for us as we move forward, and, and we're going to really follow all of the, the guidelines and directives from the Department of Health and, and the governor's office and, and the CDC and, and, and larger youth soccer organizations in terms of US club soccer and things like that. So. Um, the, the safety of the, the parents, kids, and the coaches is, our, is our, our main priority, and then we'll work within that to, to have some of our procedures in, in place. So we'll talk a little bit tonight about the registration for the COVID summer programming and, and the waiver that, that people have to sign, and, and then we'll talk about uh, the, some of the, a little bit more about the Zoom meetings as we, we roll out the summer programming. And then we'll talk about uniforms, which we've all ordered and are eager to get, and then we'll, we'll hopefully use with some scrimmages this year, and then we'll move to, to the Q&A. So, so I think, you know, really, as, you, as we think, go back to the, you know, when we started sending out our, our, our every other week summaries and trying to update the families, and, and we tried to hang on as long as we could and, and tried not to, to cancel the season too, too quickly, and, and, and as we didn't want to, to jump ahead of the data that was coming in and, and trying to take the lead of TCSL and, and some of the, the parent organizations. And obviously, um, you know, the, the, last, uh, the last summary that we had, we, we finally had to make the decision to, to cancel the season and, and do refunds for the families, just so families weren't thinking, 
and, and, and trying to clear up some of the, the uncertainty of what we're facing with, with the decision making. And then we could pivot our planning into, into the return to play protocol and the safety protocols and, and, and um, the other components that will go into the summer programming. So um, from that side of things, we started gathering up uh, you know, other organizations in terms of state organizations and, 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 the, and the, the national organizations returned to play protocols and started to craft things that would be most useful for BVU. We will, will work through the phases of this as the state allows us to, right? So as we move into phase two, where we can, can train with, with 10 or less with less people, with, with physical distancing and, and with disinfecting, and then we'll hopefully move to phase three and phase four, and, and we'll see if we get to phase five, which would be, which would be games um, like typical. So that's kind of our, our plan is to move through the phases as the state allows us to move through the phases. And that, that first phase starts on, on June 1, where we can, we can start to get back on the field. So um, one of the, the big components that we did as a club was to, to pivot to a, a COVID-19 webpage. So Jen, if you wanna yeah. share that. I would love to. So, I mean, just, just in general, right, there's so much information out there around safety, around COVID, and, and, and what's good procedure, and, and what's, what's not okay. So we decided to start putting it all down into one spot and, and the web page. So we've got the TCSL return to play phases, which really lays out what, what the phases of, of the return to play protocol will be. Um, we've got some resources that are BV United specific in terms of protocols for coaches and parents and players that that families can 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 look at and, and can review. So we have some general recommendations just in terms of which I think most people have you know hear and see just in terms of keeping your hands clean and not touching your face and and how we physical distance and you know, really trying to get the kids into the mindset of no high fives and no handshakes and no hugs, which is really strange, right? I mean, the kids are used to going out there and, and, um, and touch, you know, making contact with each other, making high fives and, and, and greeting each other. So that will certainly be something that we'll talk about and have coaches really have to, to redirect and, and be mindful of. So I think the thing that is probably the most cool that is on the website is the video that the coaches went out and, and put together. So um, I, getting, getting the coaches together and setting up what would be a session, right? That was, that is just start to finish how, how kids will arrive, the players will arrive and how the coaches will get things started and how they'll run through drills and physically distance. So that, that COVID training session sample video is on there for people to watch. And, and I'm just, I'm, it's just really, was fun to, to have the coaches and, and Jen and Greg think about that and, and want to put that together just as a visual of what this could look like. Cause this is certainly new territory for, for all of us. So I think that's a really, that's a really um, just a nice um, visual component to watch. And then we'll work hard to, to try and match that in terms of watching physical distancing and things like that. So as a club, we probably have a little bit more planning to do in terms of thinking about like how, you know, who will, who will assist with you know on the field and, and and help the coaches to redirect kids and we'll have some additional ideas in terms of how we redirect kids and parents and, and we'll certainly address questions that that parents have about safety and, and and concerns so those are as is been the whole summer it's a bit fluid but i think we have a really outstanding foundation and um and and we've thought of all the things we can think of and then we'll certainly add add more as we go so and we've worked hard to, to put that together in terms of um, the, the resources that we have and our COVID programming and, and really trying to explain the summer program and then the refund piece and then the uniform process and then communications moving forward and, and other resources. So the website should be, here's the, that's the tab that has resources for, um, uh, resources for, the different organizations that just for people can review and, and peruse and, and, and get that larger picture. So there's a lot on there. So spend some time kind of going through it and, and it certainly goes into the 
goes into the the information you know gathering that we all have been deluged with in terms of COVID specific things. But I think it's really it, it's a it's a good good website and it's BVU specific and soccer specific, and then we'll we'll go from there. So I'm really really happy about the website that that formed up pretty quickly. The coaches and Jen and Greg have been working just really hard, and the board the board BVU board has been working really hard to to get all these things or in order and to pivot pretty quickly into 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 establishing a new summer program and 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 thinking about the changes so so you know if we think about the the refunds right we've decided you know so we've we've pushed out in in previous communications the the refunds um the refund amounts and 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 i can let greg talk about that in, in a bit in terms of the you know the calculations we, there's a formula for that that we use that's not a just a random number. It's a formula based on, on, on hours on the field and number of contacts and, and for each age group. And, and um, so we're not just make, you know, not just guessing at it. There's a, there's a formula for, for Jen, just scroll down to that. So if you haven't seen what the refund totals are, are for um, one thing that probably is good to address is we, so the, the raffle, right, that we've done that, that goes into our, our overall fees. The board decided that that is still a critical fundraiser for us and, 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 and funds are really important right now with, as we do the refunds. So the board did make the decision that we would still do the raffle. So the tickets are printed, we have the gambling permit. So we are going to, we're going to retain that $50 charge that we had within the fees and we'll distribute tickets that the families can sell just like we would have, and, and then we'll still hold the raffle and, and, and have the same winners that, you know, the same um, prizes that we had uh, planned for at the tournament and, and, and still do that. So the, the $50 differential that you'll see it, when you look at the, the refund, um, that is the, the, the board made the decision that that was still an important um, uh, fundraiser for us and, and families can recoup their funds by selling the tickets to, to neighbors and we'll still draw just the same. So, so that part of it is something that, that it might be, be new to people or, or in terms of what we're keeping, essentially it comes down to the, the contacts and the, the hours up to, um, I'll let Greg say that so I don't misstate the, the dates. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll just jump in there. It's, it's certainly, it's the number of contacts per team that are allocated in the dome training facility. So every, dome chunk costs us so much money. You know, it's $150 an hour for each of those thirds. The coaching staff costs us a certain amount of money. And so basically we take the number of contacts, add up the cost, you know, the cost of the facility, the cost of the coach and divide that, um, you know, and that's what we get for our number. So the only thing that really probably is a little bit of a questionable piece here is the U11, U12. I think everything else is really cut and dry. I mean, you're nine to 10, we're going to give you your money back with the exception of the raffle we want. We don't want to, you know, impose there. Uh, 13 and plus top team and second team. It's just a difference of, of number of contacts in the dome. Um, but 11, 12 is just a little bit different because we incentivized uh, the group that chose winter training only. But the actual expense is about $250 for the winter training for total number of contacts and coaches. So that refund amount looks a little bit different. We still knocked it down, uh, but there is a little bit of a discrepancy that would look weird. Um, that's about the only way I can describe it. So if anybody has any individual questions on that, we're certainly happy to take those, but I just want to bounce back to Chris as we get back to the various options about how to handle the money moving forward. Um, so in, in my last communication, I, I did, I talked about the amount that we're refunding. So it amounts to about $220,000. So I mean, BVU is going to survive COVID. We were we were were well positioned from a financial. Um, I mean, we can absorb one COVID summer, right? We can't, <laughs> can't absorb two, obviously. But we we were we had the financial resources to weather this. It will it will drain our reserves. I mean, it will it takes out all of the hard work we've done over the years to get those reserves. But um, but we're able we're able to 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 keep the club in a in a in a good financial state in terms of being able to continue operations. So we've been able to keep the coaches paid um, for the work that they've done and we'll continue, be able to continue to do that as well, obviously with the summer programming. So 
two, a couple of the options that we had talked about is, you know, there, there's going to, the families are going to get a register, a new registration link and families can choose the summer programming, which for the $150 for the, for the seven week program. And then we'll have a couple of other options. So they'll, they'll get a link that they click on to register and they can sign up for, like I said, for the seven week summer programming. And then, or you could request a refund, right? And, and we, will, we will mail you the, the refund. Um, we're gonna, we have to do those by hand. Um, so we're going to start mailing those back on July 1st. So we've got it, we need a little bit of time to get, the, to get that situated and, and, and we'll see you know, who, who registers at what level and, and, and then get the refunds starting on July 1. So there'll be, we'll have to take June to, to get the refunds back, but you will get the refund based on, on age groups. So you can request a withdrawal and a refund. You can, if you choose the $150 um, program for the summer, we'll send you the refund, but we'll, make, we'll retain $150 of that. So it would be that refund amount per age group minus the $150. So you would still get your, the rest of your refund. And then there's two other options that, that we would like to put out there in terms of any families that have the means, if you did want to give that tax deductible donation to the club, that would be, would be really appreciated in terms of, you know, making that donation to, to BVU. It, you know, which again, I'll emphasize I'm not a tax accountant, so I would verify with an accountant, but people have told me that since the service was not provided, that it is just a do donation to a nonprofit and it should be tax deductible. So um, that, that, is, and I'm, that is there too in terms of being tax deductible. So the other thing is you, you can do any amount on that. You don't have to do the full amount. You can donate any amount that you'd like. Um, the third option would be to, to use the, the refund as a credit towards next year's season or I, um, I, we didn't talk so much about the fall programming, I guess. So that would be something that the, the group would have to talk about. The, the credit would be there. I assume you could apply it to the fall programming too. We're working from the stance that we will have a full fall program just like we typically would um, until we're told otherwise. So, so you, that credit could be used towards future programming. That allows us to keep cash on hand, right? I mean, just like any other small business is looking to keep, to keep cash on hand. So any, anything that could be donated would be really appreciated. And then any, anyone that had the capacity to, to, to push that credit into next year and, and allow us to keep some of that cash on hand would be, would, be, would be really outstanding in terms of just the financial aspect of the club. So. So that, um, that, that is the, you know, that's the refund picture and, and really, you know, consider the other, the other options as well. Listen, as a club, we get it, right? So whatever is the choice for a family is the correct choice, right? If it's a, if it's a, a, a full refund, that is great. And we'll work to see you in the fall or next year. If it's a, if you're able to donate, that's great. If you're able to do the summer programming, I mean, whatever decision is right for the family is what we support because these are really difficult times. And this is a lot of money, right, that we talk about for these programming. And we understand that. So I think, you know, it is, it, the fa each family will make the decision that's right for them and, and we will support that in any, in any way, shape or form that we can. So, so from that side, I mean, we'll, we'll certainly continue to field questions on that and, and continue to work on that. I think we've, you know, it, that information is on the website. Um, and then if you look back to the mailings, uh, uh, the email um, updates that I've done, we've had it in there as well. So, um, so there should be pretty good amount of information on the, on the refund process. And, and I don't know if Greg or Jen, if there's anything more you want to say about that. Um, <clears throat> the board has, has talked a lot about these things and, and the, the leadership of the board have, I mean, we've worked for, through all the different options and really, you know, looked at it from all the different angles and, and we feel this is the best way to approach it for BVU, so. Okay, well, I'll jump in and just discuss the survey results real quickly because it was, um, I mean, it was really impressive to have 83% of our registered participants respond or their families respond. And the likelihood of returning to train in phase two um, we just had 12 and a half percent of our families who said that they were unlikely to return. So 72% said they were likely or extremely likely with 15 and a half percent undecided. Um, 
Now the kicker was that no games was also an option there. And that's become a part of this. So with the no games function, the numbers, you know, dropped a little bit where 18% said we're unlikely to return. And I'm sure that that has an effect particularly on some of our older players, like the 18s and 19s who are in their final season. Uh, and perhaps that's, that's their personal decision. Um, it's 62% are extremely likely or likely to return with 20% undecided. Um, and so we're, you know, we're in a really good position, I think with, with the health of the, the membership and the people wanting to, to be able to get out onto the fields with our coaching staff. And we're looking forward to providing that. So I'll push over to Jen now where she can speak a little bit more directly about the return to play documents for our coaches and, and the expectations we have that your children will experience. Yeah, absolutely. So I will share my screen for this. And we'll jump from the COVID webpage to this PowerPoint that I built. All right, and then here's what we'll walk through. So move our faces a bit out of the way. So I'm gonna tackle now sort of what does return to play look like starting June 1st? Um, what will the session design look like? Uh, what safety measures will be in place? Um, that sort of thing. So hmm. there we go. Okay, so the topics will cover return to play phases, the phase two structure, um, can parents be on the field or in cars, uh, the sort of uh, multifold acclimation process to coming back together, um, the types of activities that we'll be doing in phase two. Uh, we'll quickly walk through a session chronologically and talk through uh, the different safety uh, procedures that will be in place at each point in a session. Um, and then we'll talk about BBU's plan to track attendance and then plan to communicate if in fact somebody uh, does get sick. So I just wanna sort of orient us in time um, where we've been for the past two months is phase one, digital soccer, and where we're heading next starting June 1st is phase two. Uh, that is a return to field with nine players and one coach or less, social distancing measures in place, as well as hygiene measures. Um, from there, we would progress to phase three, only when allowed by the state of Minnesota, uh, the Minnesota Department of Health. Um, and what phase three would mean is instead of limiting uh, to 10 people or less, which means we have to split our teams up into two groups. At that point, we could have our whole team together, uh, but still maintaining those social distancing protocols and those hygiene protocols. Uh, a progression to phase four, again, um, only possible when the state allows it, means that we can start to scrimmage at practice and we can start to scrimmage against other clubs in the area. And phase five is where we all want to be uh, sooner rather than later, a routine, return to pre-COVID youth soccer um, and tournaments possible again. So how do we know that we're able to go to phase two? Um, because it's allowed by the Minnesota Department of Health. If you look here, so phase two beginning June 1st, socially allows gatherings of 10 people or less. And uh, they've outlined specifically for youth sport that we're allowed to open um, per the guidance from the state. When we'll be able to progress to phase three, we don't know yet. That date is not posted. We are following the state very closely. Um, the reason we anticipate we'll be able to progress to the whole team train together when phase three from the state is announced, so we'll progress to our youth soccer phase three when phase three from the state is announced, uh, is because at that point, gatherings of 20 or less will be allowed. Uh, and the max number of people that we have on our teams is 18. So 18 plus one coach uh, puts us within those guidelines. So we'll progress through the phases as possible, uh, but certainly with safety being our, and adherence to the state guidelines being our top concern. Um, so what is it gonna look like when we get back on June 1st? I got a few email questions about this today, so I wanted to address uh, here in the webinar. Your training will be with your team, your summer team that you have already been allocated to, and that team will be broken up into two groups. So. Uh, there'll be a, you know, a group that goes first, there'll be a 10 minute break in between, and then a group that goes second. The groups will be players, uh, nine or less, plus the coach. And I got a few questions in particular about the duration of the session. So typically in the summer, our sessions for, for U13 plus are an hour and a half. Uh, and for phase two, they will be 40 to 50 minutes, uh, a little bit shorter for those younger age groups. And the reasoning there is because um, because we have to split each team into two groups, we need to 
have, uh, if we were to do an hour and a half for each group, then each coach would be on the field for six hour and a half sessions per week. And because we have to adhere to physical distancing between teams and time between sessions guidelines, we just simply don't have the, the field space or the time in the week or the day uh, to uh, accommodate six sessions per coach. Um, and additionally, given the activities that are permissible in a, in a phase two session, it's a lot of individual touches on the ball. It's a lot of um, individual fitness, that sort of thing, or, or individual passing patterns. And in those sorts of things, you get a lot of touches in a short duration. And so we don't need to go for an hour and a half. Uh, you know, even at the college level, when we do sort of a technical session, it's shorter uh, in length because it's, it's higher intensity, lots of touches on the ball. We get in and out quick. So players will absolutely get a good soccer workout. Um, and that time chunk will be shorter for phase two. However, when we move to phase three and the whole team can be together again, now we're not requiring coaches uh, to be at the field for six hour and a half sessions, potentially it would just be three per week because your whole team can be together. And so at that point, uh, we're able to expand the time of each session uh, to, a, to a more regular uh, amount, right? So U13 plus would be an hour and a half, uh, U9, U10 would be an hour and 15. And again, we'll progress to phase three as able by the state. So again, I got some questions about this today. I wanted to address it quickly. Um, parents, when you arrive at the field, we're gonna ask everybody to stay in their cars. The players will be able to leave their cars once the coaches message the families via team snap. Uh, but at that point, we do ask that parents remain in the car as well. And the reason for this is because we want the practice environment to be predictable for our coaches. And the coaches need to know and need to be able to, to maintain that the the number of people at the session is 10 or less. So if the coach is expecting nine players and then a, a parent or two leaves the car as well, well then suddenly we'd be over that 10, 10 person guideline. Um, however, we understand that there might be a moment you wanna to speak to the coach and in particular the manager might need to have an in-person conversation. So all coaches will have their phones on them, charged and ringer on at all times. And if you wanna come out of your car and speak to the coach, just shoot them a message first and say, hey, I'd love to chat quickly today. And then at that point, the coach can message you back when they know for sure that you coming out of your car would keep us within that 10 person guideline. Uh, and then of course, maintain that six feet of distance and you can have that in-person conversation. All right, so then as we think about returning to the field, um, at BVU we've had discussions about and we're aware of this is sort of an acclimation process uh, in a couple different ways. Uh, first and foremost, it's an acclimation process to a new safety protocol. Um, we understand that, that those are going to be new habits that players need to build. Um, secondly, we understand that it's a, a social reacclimation process, right? Like, what is it to see my friends in person again, uh, but also knowing I, can't, I need to maintain six feet of distance and sort of getting used to that situation. Uh, and last but not least, it's a physical and a soccer reacclimation. Um, you know, players haven't been put, uh, potentially working out in the same way that they would have been uh, at home over the past two months. And so we know in terms of physical intensity, we need to sort of gradually uh, come back together there to keep players healthy. And so with that being said, uh, we're really mindful and, and on our coach Zoom, we had a, you know explicit conversation about uh, the focus of the first practice back is those safety acclimation, is that safety acclimation. Um, so the first couple practices back, Oops. One moment here. Hmm. All right, well, I don't know how to go back, but the first couple of practices back, we will focus on that uh, acclimation to safety guidelines. So the purpose will be building those habits uh, and we'll focus on more simple soccer activities. So as you can see here in the PowerPoint, this is a grid activity where players are doing foot skills within their own grid. Um, and the idea here is that the soccer will look very similar to the at-home programming, except now we're together in person. And because the soccer is, is familiar, what we're able to do is, is cognitively focus on building those new habits. Uh, and coaches will not progress un, uh, into more complex soccer activities until they see that those habits have become second nature for players, right? So the first couple of practices, coaches will be really explicit. These are the guidelines you need to follow. Um, offer a lot of reminders. And then once we see that that's become the new way of being in the space, 
then we're able to get more creative on the softer side. So these grid activities are a possibility of the different types of activities we can do. And then once we see players getting more comfortable, we can implement things like passing patterns. So you'll notice here, um, you know, this player and this player will not be crossing paths. The, they're able to pass back and forth and work on first touch uh, and, and weight of a pass and that sort of thing um, while maintaining distance and while maintaining their own space. We're able to do things like soccer tennis. And the adjustment here is that this uh, net area, the median in between has been expanded to six feet. Uh, and then we're able to progress to sort of the most game-like um, activities, which is uh, positional play. So we can focus on things like building out of the back, and we can focus on things like uh, scoring goals and, and uh, build up toward goal scoring opportunities. And if you want to see what all of that looks like, just like Chris said, I, I encourage you to, to watch this video. The video shows in, in live time and with real people what all of those activities can look like with the health guidelines in place and the social distancing guidelines in place. So just really quickly to walk you through um, the process of a session chronologically. Uh, and I think the chron chronological detail is important because at each point there's specific safety guidelines that our coaches will be implementing uh, and that players and parents will be aware of. Um, and so before the session begins, the coach will be there to set up. They'll be wearing a mask and they'll keep them, that mask on the whole session. Uh, and they'll be mindful to set up backpack station cones and make sure that they're at least six feet apart uh, so that when players come out, they know exactly where to walk and they know exactly where their, their things belong the whole session. Coaches will have their phones on them, charge and ringer on, like I mentioned earlier. And families, when you arrive, you'll stay in your car until the coach messages you. So once the coach is set up, those backpack cones are out, they'll message the families via TeamSnap. Hey, you're ready to, your player is ready to come out to practice, make sure their mask is on, make sure they maintain six feet of physical distance from their car to the backpack cone, make sure they walk to the backpack cone and then they'll stay there until the coach gives further direction. So then once the players get on the field, uh, the coach will walk up to each player while maintaining that six feet of distance and ask two questions at the beginning of every single session. Uh, have you been sick in the last 14 days? Have you been in contact with somebody who's been sick in the last 14 days? Uh, and if the answer to either of those questions is yes, we will kindly, respectfully, calmly have that player leave the session. So if their parent is still there, they will leave immediately. The coach has their phone on them and can contact that parent. Uh, and if the parent is not still there, the coach again will kindly and calmly isolate that player um, until the parent is able to come back. If the answer to those questions is no, they haven't been sick, we're good to go for practice. Uh, and the coach will record attendance and the answer to both of those questions at the beginning of each practice. Uh, at this point, once the coach has greeted them and asked those questions, the players can remove their masks if they would like to. Uh, if they're more comfortable leaving them on, that is certainly permissible. Um, and we do know that some players uh, have some trouble breathing uh, while exercising with masks on um, and they're of course allowed to take them off at that point. Uh, and again before the practice uh, activities get kicked off before every practice the coach will remind players of important um, safety protocols uh, and will remind players of sort of a, a shorthand reminder uh, about physical distance. So on my team uh, you know I'm going to use this motion of like hey you need to you get uh, farther apart and I'm just going to say distance Right, so if I see um, you know, one of my players, hey Susie, distance, that's a really quick way for me to remind her to back up. And I'm gonna use that uh, reminder before they come six feet apart, right? So if I see them getting close, maybe I see them you know, eight to 10 feet apart, I might just offer a quick reminder. And then during the activities, it will be these, those activities that we just walk through together and the coaches, uh, as you can see, those activities were set up to maintain distance. Uh, and the coaches will proceed through those activities with clear instruction and with any necessary safety reminders. At the end of the session, players will return to their backpack cones, they'll put their masks back on, and then at that point we'll do our end of session wrap up, our one, two BVU cheer. Um, and then before the players are released back to their cars, the coach will message parents via TeamSnap again and say, hey, we had a great session, it's over, the players are ready to be picked up. And then once a player sees their parent in the parking lot, they'll raise their hand. The coach will point at them and then individually one at a time in waves, they'll be able to walk back to their car 
Uh, and of course, at that point, the coach will offer a reminder to walk back with their mask on uh, and while maintaining six feet of distance. So just really quickly, because there's two groups in phase two, group one will go with all of those measures we just spoke about. In between, there'll be a 10 minute break. So parents, as you arrive for group two, remember to stay in your car. Uh, and then the coach will start everything again for that second group. Um, and if any point uh, a player touches equipment by accident in between uh, at that first session, the coach will wash it uh, and desanitize uh, it before that next session. And then at the end of both sessions, uh, every day, the coach will sanitize all equipment, right? So if I bring out my cones, I'll make sure to wash my cones with, you know, some sort of alcohol rub or a big bucket of soap and water. I'll put them out in the sun to dry. Uh, and then at the end of each session, I, as a coach, will enter um, my attendance tracking information into the shared attendance tracking document that all coaches have. So quickly, this attendance tracking document uh, is important. All coaches have it, and it's one document. So all of the attendance tracking information for the whole club is accessible by club leadership with just a few clicks. So parents, you can do your part by being really mindful of the team stamp availability. This allows parents to plan, excuse me, this allows coaches to plan their session really carefully ahead of time. Uh, and coaches will be emailing you, uh, will email each family a PDF of the upcoming session one day prior to the session. Uh, so if they have, you know, six players coming, they can plan appropriately for that. If there's five players coming, well, now we might have to plan a little differently. So be really mindful of that team snap availability function. Uh, and then coaches' jobs will be to be really mindful of that attendance tracking. And what the attendance tracking allows us to do uh, is to contact trace and, and uh, activate our communication plan. Um, so if at any point a child or a coach becomes ill, uh, we ask that that child or coach or family contact uh, Chris Boys, the BVU president, um, president at bvunited.org. Uh, and then that will trigger our communication plan. So Chris will then contact uh, the team manager, the coach of the team involved, and any families involved via team snap uh, and also by phone if necessary. Um, and the same if a child or coach tests positive for COVID-19, uh, that same communication plan will be triggered. Um, and if uh, if a child or coach tests positive, the, the, the whole group uh, would then have to uh, return home and isolate for uh, 14 days um, or until symptom free. So that is a rundown of um, sort of session planning and safety procedures. I'm happy to, to take any questions at the end. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back over to Greg. Just to jump back in there too, we have to be aware that the city of Burnsville uh, and the city of Apple Valley are going to be out kind of, the fields just aren't going to be the fields that we're used to. They're, they're going to, the grass will be long, the lines may not be painted, and it's unlikely that the goal frames are going to be out at any, any soon. Um, so we just have to do with, you know, with what we have. Um, in addition that the PDF that Jen had mentioned that the coach would send to the team a day prior that may end up being a PDF slash uh, photo of a handwritten training session that they, they wrote down on paper. I don't want to um, yeah. overtax the coaching staff with, with delivery yeah. of that, but you'll understand the idea. Yeah. And that's the whole, that's the purpose of that. Um, just as we get into registration for the summer programming and, and the waiver form that goes with it, it's an additional waiver um, that relieves BV United of any liability should any COVID symptoms come about it. It's pretty universal at this point, like in your workplaces and, and all the different organizations and things you're going to do selective participation. And that's something that's a new reality for us. Um, in regard to the $150 fee, that is entirely committed to paying our coaching staff and maintaining our coaching staff as long as we can. It will not um, fulfill their full contracts, and, and they are aware of that, and we are aware of that. But we are doing our best to try to maintain and, and retain uh, the wonderful people that we have who, who lead our children and lead our community. Uh, in the next few days, you will be having a Zoom meeting with those coaches. So each head coach should have a Zoom meeting with the team parents. Uh, he or she would also do the same thing with the players on the team. So uh, expect that. And a lot of this information, hopefully, as we recognize that there's a limit on the attendance list here, we'll post this video right away tonight as quick as we can so that everybody has a chance to see it and view it ahead of that meeting. 
so that uh, a lot of the questions at least perhaps are mitigated prior to that conversation. But I've seen a few things in the chat function about, you know, when our schedule is going to be released. Well, that will be probably a discussion that you have with the coach in that Zoom meeting. Um, there will be a collaboration in regard to that. Uh, another comment I see here is, is in the protocol of, of player parent drop off and pick up. What if there's an older player who drives um, herself or himself to training? no problem, they're gonna be a part of that chat function in the team snap as well. So it still applies on that end. Um, that's just a little bit about what to expect moving forward. We'll just finish it up with Chris on the uniforms um, and then we'll really get into the Q&A as, as they come through. Sure, <clears throat> so the uniforms are, are hard, right? So this is a new uniform cycle for us. Uh, we ordered the uniforms and, and Planet Soccer was making them and printing them out and then, um, and then COVID happened and everything shut down. So we've been in communication with, with Planet Soccer. The, the uniforms are printed and ready to go. They're boxed up by team. Um, so they're, they're pretty well organized. Planet Soccer, um, as we had discussions with Rod at Planet Soccer, as they, they're allowed to open up, I believe on Monday as well um, for, for June 1st, um, th what they're running into is the restrictions on the number of people that they can have in their store. So having, the, you know, they don't just do our uniforms, they do uniforms for other clubs too. So having people coming through the store just to pick up uniforms will kind of tax their ability to have their actual customers through. So we walked through a few different scenarios on that and, and you know, thought about team managers distributing, but then that puts the team managers at a lot of risk and, and a lot of contact. We decided that what we would do is, is set up a, a, a drive-by pickup um, at Planet Soccer and we would have a table outside the store and our families can come by and we can, we can physically distance just like if you're at a food truck, right? You can come up and, and pick up your, your uniform. Um, it would be helpful if the parents knew the, the, the age group and the team that the kids were on and, and we can reach into the box and, and get that out for them. So, um, we don't have the schedule for that yet. We'll do a few different times and a few different, you know, different days and different times of the day to accommodate schedules and things like that. So we'll be pushing that out um, pretty soon here so everyone can get their, their uniforms um, and, and their kit. Um, given the, that we have, um, you know, players that would have been aging out this year um, and, and are stuck with a uniform that they, they will not really use this summer, um, the club is going to, in the past, we haven't done this, but we're going to develop a, an exchange system. Um, and I'm not sure, honestly, I, I'm not sure what that'll look like just yet, but we'll have an exchange system where, where the, the, the club will, will facilitate, you know, exchange and, 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 and families can, can approach other families to buy the kit and, and we'll try and allow families that don't need the uniforms for whatever reason to be able to sell to incoming families or, or, you know, or, or anyone that wants to buy BVU kit out there. So we'll, we'll set up an exchange system uh, somehow that allows, like I said, that allows people to, to, to um, sell the uniforms. We, we will not do a buyback system. I mean, we decided that that probably wasn't feasible for the club to buy back the kit, but we'll, we'll facilitate connections so people can, can sell them to other families. So, um, you know, there, there was a, a thought, we had one question around you know, will, or at least the board, we were thinking, will this extend out a third year with the, with the kit? We, we do those on two-year cycles. And, and I think, unfortunately, probably we're going to have to keep to that two-year cycle just because most of the kids grow out of that second year, that second summer. They're already getting a little bit tight for some of the kids, as the, especially the younger kids grow. So, um, you know, I guess that can be for further discussion among the board as, as we get in deeper to it. But I would probably unfortunately for this becomes a casualty of COVID where we, we, we aren't going to get two full years out of, out of the kit. So we'll, we'll evaluate that as we go a little bit more, but those are our thoughts. So look for information around pickup times and, and we'll have a drive-by pickup system um, where, where you can, where I, we think that will be ultimately the, the safest option to, to get the, the uniforms delivered to everybody. So. Yeah, and Chris, we just had a question pop in the Q and A. Um, you know, I think some of our younger players, the reg the the ordering the uniform process started later, and so some of them hadn't done it yet. And if I haven't ordered a uniform yet, can I still participate in the summer programming? Yes, absolutely, of course. Um, mm -hmm. 
that will not require a uniform. And if we get to the point where we are scrimmaging other clubs, uh, we'll make it work. We'll find a way. So no need to order one at that point. Correct. I think that's about it from my side on on the uniform and and the things that that I wanted to talk about tonight. So I can pass it back to Jen and and Greg and we can get to Q&A if people have questions. Yeah, should we jump into some questions, Greg? I, I think let's address the questions that we came up ahead of time. So, you know, one was, are there going to be summer camps? Um, and, and at this point, we've postponed them all indefinitely. And, and we'll just kind of wait information from the governor and from the MDH to decide whether or not we are going to roll those out. If it works, it probably wouldn't be until mid-July. Um, that was one question that came through. Another one was, you know, will there be goalkeeper practices this summer? The answer is in phase two, no. Uh, but if we get to phase three, yes. Uh, and I'm working with Garrett behind the scenes to create a schedule or a program uh, should that, and we expect when that um, phase moves forward. Right now, in our training sessions, the majority of what we're going to do doesn't really have much to do with a goalkeeper, at least in regard to handling the ball with their hands. So, you know, the playing out of the back and, and getting more comfortable with your feet is certainly a part of being a goalkeeper and a part of the game. And that, that's going to be the emphasis point um, as we stand. Is heading allowed? Uh, we're just going to avoid it in phase two. Uh, we haven't really received any ruling or any feedback from anybody or the governing bodies either way, but we're just going to defer from doing it until phase three. Um, and that's, of course, for the older kids who are allowed to hand the ball anyway. <clears throat> the question has come up a few times, and, and we've seen it here. And Are all players required to wear a mask the entire time? Um, no, they do not need to wear it the entire time. If they can wear it to and from, great. But if there's a medical condition uh, that prevents a, a child from even doing that, that's OK as well. Jen, you look like you had something to add there. Yeah, so we just had a question pop up in the chat. Any news on when the BVU masks will be delivered for those that ordered them? Uh, Greg, I'll, p I'll push that to you. I think they're coming soon, right? I'll push it to Chris. Yeah, oh, the, sure, sure. So that, is, that is completely uh, podium wear, right? So I think ours, boy, I'd have to look at that. I thought it was maybe June 6th that ours would be, that they're, they're in production and they would be mailed out. I thought it was June 6th. I'd have to verify that. But they will get mailed directly to you from podium wear. So there won't, there will not, that would not involve any pickup or anything like that. But I, it was certainly early, early June was, was the, the date that they had targeted. So I think in the next, uh, you know, week and a half to, to two weeks, I think, and we can, we can verify that and push that out on the podium wear uh, website, but I'm, I have, I have the sixth in my head. So. Uh, I'll just answer these last two kind of preemptive questions and uh, one. Sorry, Greg. Uh, Grant Brant Holt said it was uh, six sixteen, so I had one of the sixes in my head. So. Okay. June June sixteenth is when they'll be received. Thanks, Brant. <laughs> okay, so what about tryouts? Uh, and there was a Q and A question that came through while Jen was speaking as well about tryouts. As we are sitting today, we are planning on rolling tryouts in the traditional format. Uh, on the prescribed dates that we already had, which was July 20, 21, and then I think 26 through 30 um, or something to that effect right around those dates. We are flexible, obviously, and, and we'll rely on guidance from you know, the organizing bodies and we will not rule out any options. And, and that includes rolling a current team together into the next season. That is an option that, that we will consider if we need to. Uh, but at this point, we just don't have a lot of answers uh, until we know a little bit more information on what phase we're in at that point in time. The final question uh, that came ahead of time was, where will we be practicing? Um, and your team coach will, will let you know that in your Zoom meeting and through your team SNAP communications when the, when the schedule is laid out. But everybody is assigned a space, um, and there, is, there will be plenty of distance that's mindful of the physical distancing and, and the other things that we need to do. So it's all there. It will be rolled out very, very soon. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I got a question today, um, you know, a family concerned that maybe the Burnsville or Apple Valley fields would be closed uh, and that maybe we'd be farther out in Savage or something. And the fields that we typically use are the fields that we're, we're able to use. Um, so, for example, my team will be at Rose Park. That's a pretty typical location for girls teams. Uh, so your commute shouldn't be any different than uh, any, any larger than what it typically has been in the past. Um, I've got a few questions rolling into the Q&A. Uh, a quick one here. Um, 
do the players bring their own ball? Yes, they do. Uh, that allows them to do individual ball work with their own ball. Um, another question here, if we are forgoing some program and requesting a refund, do we have to fill something out? I've seen a link and I didn't know what to do to request a refund. Uh, can we, Chris, could you talk us through, or Greg, maybe the process on that? I, I think the, the, there should be a button on the registration link that will just be able to click um, request a refund. I, I think that should be, should be it, if I'm not mistaken. Correct, Greg? I'm not certain it's there, but it's a one, it's a great, great question. So appreciate you bringing that forward, Sarah, because we can uh, work to make sure that it is there and just ease the process for everybody. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll dig into that and simplify it and get an answer out, um, you know, by the morning. Yeah. And uh, as sort of Greg was saying, all of these things are being built uh, in live time. So if you catch something, just shoot us an email, we'll fix it right away. We appreciate that sort of help. Um, a quick question here, when does the schedule come out? So the schedule for this BBU summer program is June 1st through July 22nd. Um, we plan to have programming throughout that time and to progress through the phases as possible throughout that time. Um, any other questions as we wrap up here, please throw them into the Q&A. Uh, someone wanting to confirm about fields again. Um, are you saying that Apple Valley and Burnsville fields are open starting June 1? I'll throw that to you, Greg. I know for sure Burnsville will open with the governor's order. I haven't, I don't have confirmation that Apple Valley is, but that is my understanding. Awesome. So great question from uh, parent slash coach Tom Noonan. Are we skipping the week of the 4th? Uh, and yes, just, just as we would during a TCSL season, we want to respect that week as family time. Uh, any uh, specific dates that we know when we would be off, Chris or Greg? Yeah, I can give you a window of time here. Let me just pull up my calendar. I believe the fourth this year is a weekend. It um, is. So it would be like, you know, the third through the sixth for sure off. And odds are no one's going to go on the second, Thursday the second either. Awesome. I wish I knew the answer to that one. <laughs> yeah. The net hanging question? No, the how likely would we advance to stage four? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we just don't know at this point. Um, and we are, of course, going to advance in accordance with the state. Uh, what we have talked about is, um, you know, the, the possibility of, in lieu of our BBU Cup, a potential small-sided tournament. So there's a chance we're not able to progress to a full 11 v 11 game, but, but potentially a small-sided sort of competition. So the likelihood that we get to scrimmage 3 v 3 before we get to pra uh, play official games 11 v 11 is pretty high. And we'll, of course, um, progress through that as, a, as we're able to. And the, the phases are not determined by us. That will be that. Those are those will be determined by the state. So I mean, we'll we will just follow along with with that. So. Right. Um, should we talk about net hanging? Yeah, I think. I mean, the again, we don't have as much communication from the city of Apple Valley. Um, the city of Burnsville hasn't, um, in the, the email that was either yesterday or today, um, Greg, you'll have to correct me if I'm wrong, but they, they, you know, they talked about, we will be able to get on the fields and then we have to be prepared that they are in reduced operations. So they certainly would be, they won't probably be the length that we hope for, like Greg talked about in terms of being, being well manicured <laughs> mode. And I think they're not quite sure if they're going to get frames out or not. So if they, put frames out, we'll hang nets on them. Um, we'll, Mary Bird, um, who's our field coordinator, will we'll do that. We're not quite sure if they're going to, with their reduced staff, and it's not like they were not hiring maybe as much part-time summer help at Burnsville for sure, so we'll see what they're able to, to get done. Um, they, they've been very clear that they're in a state of reduced operations, so we'll have to see what we get, and, and if we get frames, we'll put nets on them. So. Yep. So we got a question, if the state decides to go to stage four, would BBU uh, follow um, or, or would BBU take into account some other sort of statistics or information? Um, recently, after the last announcement by the governor, 
the state announced specific guidelines for youth sport in particular. Uh, so we feel quite confident that we can follow those guidelines. Certainly, um, we don't want to follow general state guidelines. We don't want to follow state guidelines for restaurants. You know, youth sport is a specific arena, uh, but because they're publishing those, um, we feel pretty confident that we can follow that. All right. Linda has a great question there. If, if all players on a, on a team decide to forego registering for summer training, how will groups of nine players be formed for phase two? So in this instance, the idea would be that I might have a team of, you know, 16 players and 12 of them decline participation, right? So there's only four children left or even fewer. What do we do at that point in time? Well, the coach will still be with that group of however many that is to work with. If the number isn't feasible, like it's, you know, if it's one-on-one, -on -one, it, it might be one-on-one, -on -one, but I think we'll be more effective in, in moving that player into another group that is uh, appropriate for their ability uh, and level. Those are answers, I, um, and those are tricky because we, we have to wait now for the data to come back. So we have to wait right. for everybody that's listening here or out as, as families to, to register. Or, or decline registration. And then from that point, moving forward, our team coaches and, and Jen and I can come up with a more formidable plan. Yeah, so, so we'll be informing coaches as registrations roll in of who on their team is going to continue uh, with the summer programming and we'll work with coaches uh, to form those, those small groups. Uh, and of course we understand that players wanna be with their whole team and, and coaches are gonna do their best to form those small groups based on um, you know, positional play potentially or friendships or whatever, uh, but, but create them in a way that makes sense for that specific group. Uh, and then in all likelihood, um, that phase two, my assumption will be shorter than phase three. We'll see what happens. But when we get to phase three, those small groups won't matter so much anymore because we'll all be back together as a, as a full team. Um, we've got a question rolling in. Uh, what should managers do with the volunteer deposit? checks good question um we will we will have to talk about that as a board but my guess since we're not i mean we will <clears throat> shred those or return those just like we would if you'd fulfilled your volunteer requirement because we don't i mean it's <clears throat> the the tournament is in significant jeopardy if not already just I mean it seems unlikely that a tournament will happen in July at the pace that people are you know that the, the phases are so it's less likely that we'll need volunteers this year so um, I, I assume that we will shred those and and and, re and deal with them as though we we would um, after everyone completed their volunteer session if that makes sense so yeah, and we can if get that was clear. That maybe it wasn't clear. <laughs> Sorry. We can have Sarah Brander follow up on that information as well yeah. and send out a, a clear email to all managers yeah. about volunteer checks. I've just made a note of that. So we'll be we're sure not keeping that. it is the answer though, right? So the, the issue is gonna be what people I mean, we you know, we we are not keeping your hundred dollar deposit for the volunteer um shift that we're not gonna require of you. So if that if that clarifies that, um we're 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 not gonna keep your check. The only money we're keeping is going to be the $50 raffle and we'll run that just like the fundraiser it is. So, but we do not need the hundred dollar. Um, yeah. And we just had a, we, we just had a comment roll in from Sarah Brandner, um, our manager director. And she said that she's been thinking about that exact thing and an email will come out very soon about it. Um, we had a question roll in about what stage would contact on the field be allowed scrimmages. So, we're seeing that uh, scrimmages contact on the field would be that sort of phase four. Um, and we'll progress into that as the state allows. There's, there's potential too that in stage three when the full team is allowed that contact would be allowed um, in mitigated circumstances or at least for length of time. So we're not aware that that is for sure stage four, but we do know the scrimmages would be held back until stage four. Yeah, and, and as we get word that we're able to progress through the stages, we'll of course send out club communication at that point about what that means, um, you know, with a lot of uh, some time in advance for you to read that before, before our first stage three practice, for example.
All right, so question rolling in from uh, about the raffle. If you're going to have a raffle, how will the raffle tickets be distributed? Um, <clears throat> that might be the they, get in the, they get in a bag, you know, the, the coaches hand them out to the kids um, at a session or we will decide that when we do the planet soccer drive by pickup, we'll have the tickets there or there'll be some, we, we're not going to mail them out to everybody because that's probably not feasible, but we will in some way, shape or form quickly get tickets distributed to people in the, with enough time that they can, that they'll have time to sell them. So, <clears throat> good question. so we'll, we'll have a process for that, but that's a good question, but we will get the tickets to you in a, in a manner that, um, that you can work to sell them. So. All right. A few more thoughts coming in. Thanks for the feedback, Roland. We appreciate you being here. Uh, and of course, we are glad we we're able to get this information out to you. Um, I can hit it if you want. So if stage three would still have social distancing and no contact, I thought stage three would still have social distancing and no contact. So this is me who's created confusion. So I'll address it. If the requirements for a stage change, would a partial refund be available then? Of the $150, sure. We're happy to make that happen for you if that's a, a, a point of comfort, no problem at all. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, stage three uh, does say you know, social distancing is still a part of it. So um, I may have jumped the gun and saying that could be a alteration. <clears throat> yeah, and, and we've spoken with coaches that um, as we progress through the phases, you know, if and when we're able to that, uh, you know, then they absolutely connect with parents and families at that point and, and really clearly spell out what that next step looks like. Um, so expect from us some, some really clear communication around that. And there may be some more guidance on that too. I mean, there's a lot of focus on proximity and time, right? So someone might decide yeah. you won't do a set, you won't do a corner kick, right? Where there's a scrum inside the 18 yard box, but, but the rest of a, a typical soccer flow would be outside of the time and proximity. So time and distance of exposure. So, I mean, that will be directed toward to us we will not craft that on our own but the way that that some of the verbiage and, and the way people are talking you know in terms of that i've read is shifting you know as as people all activities start to venture out there's going to be a lot of talk about time and proximity so what it, what activities can happen if you just pass someone right you're 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 less likely if you stick stay by them and and have an exchange then you're the risk is greater. So if you're just passing someone within six feet, then the time side of it comes in, right? So and 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 so I, that, that we'll watch for guidance on that as as people advance through the phases. But that'll certainly you'll, you'll hear a lot more of that in all settings in terms of restaurants and 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 stores and things. So in these activities, will you know, fitness gyms and, and everything. Everyone's going to be talking about proximity and time. So in terms of how the the virus is transmitted and things. So that'll be something that we may have to shift as we go, right, as the phases present themselves and we'll follow the guidance on, on the, the powers that be in terms of, of what the, the safest way to approach it is, so. Yeah, and there's been some really interesting uh, studies actually about professional soccer. I know Greg can speak to this too, but um, you know, the, the, they've timed the number of contacts you have within a six foot radius of someone during a game and how long those contacts are. And it's actually a lot shorter than you would imagine. So they did a study in stat sport. It's one of the providers that I work with at the university. They, they logged 172 hours of training sessions over four teams. And for sessions that had eight to 10 players on an average in an 84 minute session, there were uh, 226 contacts. The average amount of time at each intervention was 3.3 seconds. When that group grew to 18 or a larger size, the number of interactions elevated to like 680, uh, but the amount of time decreased to 2.8 seconds per interaction. So that's the data that we're using at the university level as we try to uh, move forward and get the and get the scholastic version of soccer moving forward. 
I want to bounce back just and, and answer one more question here that came up in the Q&A. And it says that can someone that is not with BV United sign up for the new summer training with BV? If they are currently registered with another uh, club, then the answer is no. If they are not a registered uh, player, then, then yes, that is something that we would entertain on a team by team level. Uh, and we just had one more quick, uh, important thought pop up. For any families that were not able to attend tonight, um, where can they watch the video? And we're gonna download this, uh, get it on YouTube as soon as possible. And uh, let's also talk about getting it up on the webpage, that COVID-19 resources yep. webpage. Um, so that will be up by the end of the night. It, it will be up as soon as possible. All right, and with that, should we wrap it up here? Mm -hmm. I think so. Well, so, I mean, I, what I, I want to thank the staff and, and the coaches for all the time and, and the board for all the time that, that they're putting in. And this is, it's a lot of work that everyone's happy to do, but, but it's, you know, it, this is, these are trying times and, and the amount of effort that people are putting in is, is really tremendous. And, and, and behind the scenes work is, is just tremendous at the coach level and at the board level and at, at, at at each level of the staff. So, I mean, the, the even, even, you know, club administrator Allison is getting a bunch more tasks that she wouldn't have done, right? We're creating registrations and, and moving things. So from my perspective, I want to thank everyone in terms of at, at, the, at the organizational level. And our families have been just fantastic, right? I mean, I, I mean our, our families have been exactly what we expect out of BVU. You've been patient, you've asked good questions, you've pointed out things that need to be thought about. And, and, and I, I just can't talk highly enough about the, the response from the families and, and, the, and, and being able to work through the uncertainty with us. And now we've got a little bit more of a concrete plan um, that will likely shift on the fly as we move. But um, so for my part, as the, the president, I just want to thank everybody for their, their flexibility and, and ability to shift into, into this new time. So, um, so thank you again and, and, and look forward to, to more communications from us as, as we, we move this forward, so. All right, well, a quick thank you to me, uh, from me to all the coaches, managers, uh, families and players as well. It, it's been really remarkable to see you all stick through uh, this period with us uh, and, and to keep doing soccer from home. Um, you know, on many days you've motivated me to, to have a, a better day, to feel connected to community. Um, and I just can't thank you enough. And I'll speak for all the coaches too and thanking all of you and just say that we really look forward to being back on the field and seeing all these kids again in, in real life. Yep. All right, and with that, we will uh, end the webinar and get this recording up real quick. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.